Welcome to this edition of Real World Government Contracts Law, where we discuss real world issues and legal updates impacting government contractors. My name is Stephanie Wilson. I'm a partner here at Barron's Y. Glennard and a leader of our, our firm's government contracts practice. With me today is a special guest, Robert Jones of Left Brain Professionals. Robert is a CPA with more than 17 years of DOD and uh, contracts and accounting experience. He's also an award-winning speaker and frequently presents on how best to navigate the constantly changing legal and regulatory landscape of government contracts. Robert, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, before we jump into our topic today, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Left Brain Professionals and how you guys uh, help government contractors? Sure. Um, I like to describe us as a boutique accounting firm and that we work only with government contractors. Uh, we live, eat, and breathe the FAR and the cost accounting standards uh, on a daily basis. This is what we do all day, every day. And a lot of work we do with clients is with uh, accounting system design, implementation, audit support, uh, and specifically uh, topics like we're going to talk about today around the uh, PPP forgiveness, uh, indirect rates, and the incurred cost proposal. Yeah, as you mentioned, the, the reason we're here today is this is actually a topic that you and I have discussed several times over the last couple of weeks. And that is the reporting and accounting issues that some of these COVID relief programs uh, present that are specific to government contractors. And so, you know, this includes the PPP, uh, the Paytech Protection Program loans, as well as the Section 3610 funding that is part of the CARES Act and some other related tax credits and issues. And so um, we've covered the Paycheck Protection Program loans in several episodes of our podcast series here. Um, but what we're talking about here is really specific to government contractors. And currently, many companies are going or starting to go through that loan forgiveness process. And I think what we want to talk about today are specific things that government contractors need to be aware of as they apply for PPP loan forgiveness. So at the outset, is there anything, any difference between the expenses that um, government contractors can qualify for for forgiveness in the PPP loans um, that are different than what other businesses can, can qualify for? No, it's, uh, you know, the one program applies across the board to everybody. It doesn't matter what the nature of your business is. Uh, the eligible costs that we talk about are uh, payroll costs is what the PPP refers to them as. Uh, obviously, in the government uh, world, we talk specifically about um, types of labor. Uh, and one of the things we'll talk a little bit more uh, later is the specific need to identify uh, direct labor, overhead labor, and GNA labor as different types, just like we do in other aspects of government contract accounting. Uh, the payroll costs uh, also include group health uh, benefits paid by the employer, uh, the employer's state and local taxes, retirement plan contributions, business mortgage interest, rent, utilities, uh, those expenses that are necessary for things like uh, PPP and otherwise complying with uh, you know COVID-19 uh, restrictions um, and expenditures uh, that were otherwise uh, essential at the time of the purchase and operating costs for things like software and cloud computing services. So if the categories of the expenses are the same, what is it that government contractors really need to be careful about when they're tracking these eligible payroll costs and other expenses when they're applying for forgiveness? So I kind of hinted at part of it, um, you know, that need to segregate labor is one of them. Uh, for commercial companies, right, many companies out there that are otherwise going after uh, PPP loans and forgiveness, when we look at their trial balance or their income statement, we typically see a single line item for salaries and wage expense, right? They don't have a need to break things out. But government contractors, in order to properly calculate the indirect rates, need to have that information broken out. Um, and it's usually one of the issues that we discover early on in working with clients who are new to government contracts. Um, so for government contractors in this specific case, they're going to need to identify when they're applying for forgiveness, or more importantly, uh, when they're calculating indirect rates and completing the incurred cost proposal, they're going to have to be able to identify uh, exactly which labor expenses they're applying that to. Right? Again, if you look at a commercial entity where they have a single 
salaries and wage expense, right? It's not a big deal. They, uh, and obviously most companies have more wages um, than are necessary to qualify for the forgiveness. Uh, but in the case of a government contractor, because that total salary and wage expense is likely sp split across uh, at least three or maybe more uh, general ledger accounts, then they're going to have to identify which of those labor accounts uh, are, are coming into play. Following up on that, why is it important that um, contractors you know, don't necessarily use these PPP loans, or at least those that they're going to ask for forgiveness for towards their direct costs, their direct labor? So uh, the biggest thing really, and really, I guess needs to be kind of the, where we start in all of this conversation is talking about uh, FAR 31.201-5. Uh, and that's the clause that tells us uh, that the government has to get credit for any kind of rebates, refunds, uh, otherwise credits that you receive. Um, it certainly applies here, you know, sometimes where that comes into play, just to kind of put it in context, uh, uh, you know, how else that, that clause comes in. Uh, if you, let's say you buy some supplies or equipment and you later get some kind of rebate from that vendor, right? You get some kind of quantity discount or something that comes in the form of a rebate later. Because that's a reduction in your cost and you're charging the government for those costs you have to pass those costs through. So when we look at PPP forgiveness or really any of the COVID-19 relief, right? And this could potentially apply to um, the employee retention credits and other things out there. If you're otherwise getting some kind of reimbursement, you have to provide that reimbursement back to the government. Um, and it's really important when we talk about direct labor, because we wanna make sure that, um, you know, if I'm billing the government, obviously for my direct labor or any of my direct expenses, and then I apply my indirect rates on top of that, I cannot apply that PPP forgiveness to those direct expenses and to get reimbursed uh, from the government, you know, through the uh, form of an invoice, right? Because there I'm double dipping and that's going to be the red flag that's going to get me in trouble. So with all that in mind, do you have any strategies that you recommend for government contractors to be able to track these costs so that way they can maximize the amount of PPP loan forgiveness that they can receive? The trick is, is really documentation, right? And uh, and that applies even just in, again, for anybody going after the PPP loans, right? So uh, the guidance I know you provided, that we provided to clients uh, all along has been, you know, if you're gonna use an expense and, and you're gonna use that to claim your forgiveness, you gotta have good documentation to back it up. Uh, you know, so obviously payroll records, invoices, statements, those kinds of things. When it comes to government contractors and the specific issues that we're talking about here, especially with labor and the fact that labor is gonna be broken out uh, among uh, a, a different or multiple GL accounts, then government contractors are gonna to wanna to report that breaks that out. Uh, so let's say for example, um, I have a $100,000 loan and I'm just gonna to try to use simple round numbers to keep it easy here. Right, and we know that at least 60% of those expenses have to be payroll oriented in order to be eligible right, for PPP forgiveness. So in my example here, I'm gonna say I have $60,000 of my $100,000 loan that's going to be, you know, that I'm gonna use my payroll expenses. And for further simplicity, I'm just gonna say it's all uh, actual labor. I'm not gonna get into some of the other uh, pieces there. So of that $60,000, I then need to be able to show that Let's say you know twenty thousand of that came from G and A labor, forty thousand of it came from overhead labor, as an example. And again, we want to stay out of a situation where we are applying PPP forgiveness to any of the direct expenses, uh, because I would otherwise again be billing the government for those direct expenses and applying my indirect rates to them. So, is there anything else um, as far as the PPP? forgiveness that would impact government contractors incurred cost proposals that they should be aware of? The way it plays out is in the calculation of the indirect rates. And so that's going to affect um, your actual rates that you calculate for your purposes. It's going to be uh, the information that you enter on the incurred cost proposal at the end of the fiscal year, uh, which obviously right now, you know, is a perfect time to be talking about this subject, right? Uh, we've got many companies 
that operate on a calendar year, right? So they're, they're closing out December 31st. Um, for those companies that have an incurred cost proposal requirement, um, that's gonna be due June 30th. So hopefully you're already thinking about that and, and you've got all this information right in front of you right now. Um, back and it ties back to this FAR 31 requirement, right? So FAR 31 201-5 again states that you know we have to, we as a government contractors have to give the government credit for any of those refunds or rebates. So if I in my case here of my sixty thousand dollars that I was using for labor, then I've got to go in, you know, on my when I'm calculating my indirect rates, when I'm preparing my incurred cost proposal. I'm going to have to make an adjustment to say, this was my beginning overhead labor. Uh, I took forty thousand dollars out because I got reimbursed, you know, for that amount through uh, my PPP loan. Here was my beginning G&A labor. I'm going to back out the amount that I was reimbursed, you know, my twenty thousand dollars that I was reimbursed through the PPP loan. That's going to bring my pool down, right? So it's going to affect that rate. Um, that ultimately comes through. Let's turn to another relief program that a lot of government contractors were able to take advantage of this year, and that is the Section 3610 of the CARES Act. And so that program allowed, um, although it did not require contracting officers, to, on a contract-by-contract -contract basis, provide additional funding to contractors to keep staff in a ready state if their employees could not work on site and also couldn't complete their work remotely. So. Um, how should contractors be tracking and reporting their Section 3610 funds uh, when they're talking about their accounting practices? Sure. So the 3610 funds should have been added uh, through a modification uh, to the existing contract. It should be a separate CLIN. Um, now, it could have been a cost type CLIN. It could have been a fixed price CLIN, uh, depending on how they negotiated that uh, with the contracting officer. Um, but they're going to charge those uh, that time. So let's let's just talk in terms of labor, right? Because that's the whole point of of thirty six ten, right? Is is the labor expense. So in that case, where I've got employees who are sitting at the ready, they're not able to do the work, right? Which is the reason that they're getting the thirty six ten. They're sitting at the ready um, because in, in this situation, the government is paying for the readiness, right? That's the deliverable of the contract at that point. I now have a line item on my contract that says I'm delivering readiness. So that is now a direct cost. So those employees that are, um, again, sitting at the ready, they're going to um, charge that time direct, right? So you should have a separate because you've got a separate CLIN on your contract, you should have a separate uh, time uh, charge reporting code in your timekeeping system uh, for, for your employees to select. And then you're gonna report that as a direct cost um, on your incurred cost proposal. Uh, obviously it's gonna go into the calculation of your indirect rates as a direct cost, and it's gonna go uh, on the incurred cost proposal as a direct cost. So what would you say are some of the best practices that a federal contractor should keep in mind as they're going through the process of seeking PPP forgiveness and preparing their incurred cost proposals, um, you know, after they've received some of the relief from these these programs? Uh, it, I, I'm never going to stress documentation enough in all of this. It's confusing. Uh, we got to make sure that, uh, you know, even among the programs that we're not double dipping. So, you know, government contractors, as I previously mentioned, you know, have to be careful that we're not invoicing the government and receiving reimbursement for costs there and getting reimbursed for the same cost through the PPP loan. That's a definite no, no, but even across or among the various, um, uh, COVID relief options that are out there, right? So if I have certain wages that I could be, so I guess let's try to paint, paint a picture here of, of where a contractor could be. A contractor could be in a situation where they have 3610 funding on some contracts, and keep in mind that is a contract by contract situation. So I could have a situation where a contracting officer, you know, maybe didn't have the money or otherwise didn't approve 3610 funding. I've got some contracts that do. So I've got potentially employees who are sitting idle that are charging direct because I have 3610 funding and I have some I have some employees who are sitting idle that are charging indirect, 
right? Because I don't have work for them to do, so they're charging overhead. That right there is, go, you know, is tricky, right? We're gonna have to make sure that the employees are selecting the right um, uh, items in the timekeeping system. We have to make sure on the back end uh, that those items are configured appropriately, that they're reported appropriately. We can obviously have situations where, you know, we're using salary dollars for employee retention credits or for uh, some other options that are out there. Uh, there are some state level grants and things that I know are available. Again, that's going to vary state by state, uh, city by city, some grants that are available to certain businesses. And you're not, again, the, the biggest thing is you're not going to be able to reuse those uh, dollars across the programs. So let's take a step back and look at what a contractor might look like. Let's say they had $500,000 in salaries and wage expenses overall. Well, they might have $75,000 that's going towards 3610. They might have $100,000 that's going towards uh, PPP forgiveness. They may have $50,000 that's going towards um, you know, the employee retention credit, and they may have some other chunk of money that's not going to any credit at all. Um, and, and again, the, the key is gonna be that the timekeeping is correct, that the general ledger is correct, and that you've got documents that back up all of it. Um, our recommendation as much as possible, try to keep all of that in one Excel workbook, right? You might have multiple tabs where you're tracking stuff for each of those programs or for each of those contracts, but having a summary tab at the beginning of that workbook um, is going to be critical right, for all of your reporting purposes because the problem is going to be, as it always is with accounting and audits, those audits, those questions come up months from now, years from now, and somebody coming back and trying to remember, well, did we do it here? Did we do it there? Right? And, you know, I see you smirking because you and I have been through this with our clients, yep. but that's going to be the ultimate key is having um, having a workbook to track all of the, the, the crazy information. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, uh, you know, one thing we always have to go over with our clients and have especially talked about them with during this PPP process is to document things, you know, throughout the process, document your need for it, document, you know, your uses, even if you don't necessarily need to submit everything with your forgiveness application, kind of go through that process as if you did. Keep everything there because you never know if you're one of the companies yep. that's going to be audited, and then particularly, obviously, if you're a government contractor, you need to keep these in mind for some of your other reporting and auditing requirements as well. Yeah, and it's gonna be, you know, again, I, I like the idea of having as much as possible kind of everything in one Excel workbook, because then at the end of the year, uh, you know, you can file a copy of this with your tax return. You can file a copy with your PPP loan forgiveness. You can file a copy with your incurred cost proposal, right? And so everything is pointing back to the same uh, set of information. And, and it's easy then to say, okay, you know, I, I know what happened for this particular report or for this application. Right. So Robert, this has been um, really helpful and really insightful. Uh, after kind of talking through all this, I wouldn't be surprised that you and I might get clients who reach out to us and say, should we even bother applying for forgiveness? That sounds like, you know, a, a big task. And what if we haven't been, been keeping track of all of these documents up to date? So what would your advice be for someone in that situation asking that question? So my first advice is take advantage of it, right? I mean, the government has stepped in to provide funding. You know, they recognize that, you know, there were problems. Um, and certainly while there are issues itself within the PPP program, overall, it's been a great program, right? It's been the saving grace for a number of companies. Um, and right now there's an op opportunity to get a second round. So we, if whether you participated in the first round or not, um, you may qualify to participate in the second round, right? And so if you're still in that situation, get out there and take advantage of the, you know, of the opportunity. Take advantage of the free money. I mean, let's be honest, right? Let's, let's, let, let's, who doesn't want free money? Now, you know, does it come with a cost? Yes, obviously there's some reporting and some stuff to deal with, but at the end of the day, I think it's the right thing. Um, you know, when it comes to specifically, you know, the indirect rates and, and the impact, uh, you know, I think some, because of what we talked about of having to apply that credit back, right? I know one of the questions that we've received and some of the confusion, somebody will say, well, isn't that gonna lower my indirect rates? Well, 
Yes, possibly, maybe. It, it, it's really going to vary. It's hard to say um, without getting into the details, you know, of each company. Because here's something that does happen outside of the PPP world, right? Things that we've seen in other slowdowns and shutdowns um, over the years. Companies have skilled, knowledgeable workforce, whether they're professionals, um, whether they're tradespeople on the front line. You know, we've invested a lot of time and money and training, and we don't want to lay off those people, right? We don't want to lose them because, you know, we're fairly confident the work is going to come back. And if we lay them off or furlough, do something right, we run the risk that when the work comes back, that employee has gone to work somewhere else, right? They have found, right? They, they got to take care of themselves, right? So they found other work to pay to pay their own bills. So what a lot of government contractors do during these ebbs and flows, right, is they put people on indirect, right? That goes back to that comment I was saying earlier that we've got some idle employees. Companies make, uh, you know, a, a knowledgeable decision to say, we're going to put them on overhead. That's going to drive up our indirect rates, right? Because now my overhead pool is going to go up. My direct pool is going to come down. So we have what I refer to as the double whammy effect on my indirect rates. Um, and so actually getting PPP forgiveness might be a saving grace for you. You might be in a situation where you have had a significant shift and your indirect rates have gone the wrong direction for 2020 or even in 2021 as this continues on. And having the ability to apply those credits to your indirect rates can actually be very helpful for some companies. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Robert. Um, I think our uh, clients and other listeners are going to really appreciate your insights here. I think it's been very helpful. And um, that's a wrap. And I'll look forward to speaking with you soon. Thanks.